by listening to recommendations from my otaku spouse or otaku susume. I'm Jen. And I'm Wes. So let's get started. Jennifer and Wesley are an odd couple. Not that they are odds with each other, but because they are not like most other couples. For one thing, they are both outliners from the rest of society. Nerds, geeks, otaku. And for another thing, they recommend things to each other, and then record themselves talking about these things. Indeed, they are an odd couple. I mean, you just made a case for you being an odd gen, but I don't see how I fit into this. Because <laughs> you married me and we're in this together. Ha <laughs> ha. Shoot. So... I recommended to Wes a game called The Stanley Parable. Yes, you did. And funnily enough, we both enjoy video games, but we both enjoy very different video games. Yes, we do. And this is actually one video game I've not played myself. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's one that I saw a Let's Play of, and I really thought it was funny. And then I met you, and we started going out, and I thought, oh, this is totally Wes's cup of tea. But even though I recommended it to you over and over and over again over the years, you never actually got it until... I was able to force you to buy it on the summer Steam sale. Yes. And then I made you play it, and I watched you play it. Yes. Which is great, because I hadn't watched anyone play it through in years, so I remembered one bit, and I completely forgot the rest. Fair enough. So... So I have the Steam sale to blame for all this. Indeed. That and my weird, dry humour. So do you want to explain what the Stanley Parable is? The Stanley Parable is a video game that explores my dark, dark past as a wage slave. (laughs) <laughs> and the insanity that goes in turn with it. You play a man locked in a cubicle named Stanley. But you were never locked in a cubicle. Who one day finds that his co-workers has van- have vanished, and a voice in his head is narrating what he's doing. Yeah, that that's pretty much sums it up. Yeah, that's about it. And then... And we don't really want to say too much about it. I, I mean, we're there's probably going to be spoilers in this. So if you haven't played it, go play it, because the one thing I will give away is it's not super long. Or if you don't care about that, you can listen to me talk about it, because I'm going to say stuff about it. Yeah. I don't think it's possible to really talk about it without really spoiling some of the best bits. It's a game. (laughs) That came out in 2011. Yeah, it was originally a source mod, and then it became its own standalone thing. And I guess there were some changes between the original mod and the standalone. I think so, yes. I know that they used the uh, Half-Life 2 engine. Everything did. Well, source mod would be Half-Life 2 engine. Ah, yes. Using the Source Engine under the Galactic Cafe Studio name. I'm reading the Wikipedia page. Fair enough. I don't know this stuff. What are you talking about? Anyway, so what did you think? Oh, what What was your initial thought? Because I didn't tell you anything about this game apart from play this game. That's true. You said you don't want to give me any prior preconceptions and you didn't want me to look anything up about it. Correct. So I didn't. So I went and got the Steam... I went and got the game on the Steam page. However that works now. Um... And then hooked up the computer to the living room TV, and you sat next to me, and I played it. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed the game. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I noticed that when you started playing, you spent a lot of time in the first few rooms looking around and trying to interact with things and trying to open doors. Yes, but it's quickly shown that that's not going to happen very much. Yeah, so what was it that, what was your literally initial thought, and then what made you realize the gameplay for this was slightly more... was a little different from what you were probably used to. Well, I mean, at the beginning, just from the way you'd set it up, despite trying to not give me any preconceptions, you'd give me preconceptions. I'm sorry, I'm just... I'm really bad at Well, I, I think that's just... It's, it's the nature of the beast. <laughs> I'm a beast? Yes. What? But when everyone is saying, like... Or when you hear Rude. things that, oh, a game is very different, or it's this or it's that, or even when someone says, I want you to play this game, but I don't want to tell you anything about it, because that'll change how you think about it it changes how you think about it <sighs> that's true don't think of a black cat makes you think of a black cat exactly an adorable black cat with big green eyes yes and so i you start the game and i'm in the source engine and i've played a lot of games in the source engine so i'm very familiar with how that game feels you know different engines feel different ways even when you get different games built in them an engine will feel in a certain way and this was early enough in it that it you know it, it felt like early Counter-Strike Source or Half-Life or anything that was made like that back in those days. And so you had that same basic feel. You couldn't jump, which I guess they took that out. You could still crouch. Um, the interact button, well, I was playing on a gamepad, which I'd never actually played a Source game on a gamepad before, but you know, I'm willing to bet the interact button was the same interact button. The door handles sounded like door handles that I'm using. Anyway, so it felt very familiar. 
from the start. And you kind of get the lead in with the voice talking about how Stanley lived in a cubicle all his life pushing buttons, and then one day something strange happened, and then you're put in this room. And so on some level, I was going, okay, is this kind of a mystery type thing? But then once you can't interact with anything, I threw that out. Mm-hmm. Like, this isn't a mystery type thing. This is a different type of game. And so that's when I started moving along. And as soon as you get to the first story room, in my opinion, would be the room with the two doors. The voice kicks back in and he says, Stanley came to a room with two doors. And knowing he had to go to the meeting room, he takes the door on the left or whatever he says. And I so, think you go to the meeting room and then you go to the two doors. No, two doors first. Two doors first? Yeah. The left, you the left door through. takes you to the meeting room. Okay. The right door takes you to the break room. Um, and so as soon as the voice kicked in there and told me that, I realized what kind of game it was. Especially because in modern day, those types of games have made a vi- are starting to make a resurgence, but not on the platform a lot of people would think about it. And that's going to lead to something that I think is my overall view of the game, mm-hmm. in that I had fun playing it. I don't think I'll play it again. And I'm glad I got it on sale. Yeah, that's a fair assumption. I mean, that's a fair review. And so before I say where all these modern versions of this game are, I'm going to lead into it in a way. Ooh, okay. The reason why... So I grew up playing games like this. But when I was a kid, they were different from the Stanley Parable. And as I'm saying modern, they're still different from the Stanley Parable. And what makes them different is the medium in which they're presented. Because the Stanley Parable is at its core... Like actually, I guess a lot of computer games are. But at its core, it is a choose-your-own-adventure story. Yes. You go through... At the end of some pages, you're going to have some pages that describe things, and at the end of other pages, it'll be like, if you choose the left door, turn to page blank. If you turn the right door, turn to page blank. Ah, so you started with the choose your own adventure stories, literally the novels. Yeah, and I had those as books. You know, they were just, I don't know if they are still popular, but when I was a kid, they were pretty popular for kids' books. I think they still exist, and I think there were some actually made for more grown-up audiences who grew up with them. Probably. I mean, I played a role-playing adventure once that was a solitaire adventure that was a choose-your-own-adventure, but half the things weren't just turn to this page. It was make a skill check and then turn to this page. Hmm. But that's getting off the subject. So I, I read a bunch of those books as a kid. And then Stanley Parable came out and I never played it. And then I did the modern version of Choose Your Own Adventure, which Netflix has started doing. Oh, they thought they've only done it once. They've done it at least twice now. Really? And I'm going to presume that there's going to be more coming because they can, so why not? That was Bandersnatch and... Bandersnatch and Carmen Sandiego. Wait, what? Carmen Sandiego, the Netflix show, has a special episode that's a choose your own adventure. Really? Yes. That Wait. I've, not, I've not done it yet. I just know it exists. Well, yeah, because you're not going to do it without me. No, I'm not, because we're watching that. Yeah. But that's getting off the subject. Even though you played Bandersnatch without me. You didn't tell me you wanted to do it until I... after I'd already done it. <laughs> I still want to play it. Fair enough. Um... <laughs> But, and this is why where I'm getting to the whole thing, I don't like how Netflix and the Stanley Parable present the Choose Your Own Adventure story because of one thing. What's that? And that is when you're reading a book and you've gotten an hour into it or whatever, and you know that things are hotting up, you can sit there and put your finger in a page mm-hmm. and then read the rest of one branch, then go back and read the rest of another branch. And with things like Stanley Parable and Bandersnatch... You can't put your finger in a page. You have to do it, go right to the end before you can start again. And if you start again, you have to remember all the weird little things that got you to where it was so you can see the other path. And at some point, I get tired of doing that. Because there's not enough gameplay in Stanley Parable to keep me hooked. Also add into the fact that because it's a computer game, there's a billion more variables that could happen. And I don't want to try to mentally keep track of them when I'm just at some point trying to figure out, okay, what are the different endings? Um, I got, I don't know, I have no idea how many endings there are, but I think I got half a dozen of them. Mm, Yeah. Um, And I saw what I thought took to be evidence of a lot of different variables that somehow or another I had tripped while going through those. And I don't want to know which of those variables I would have to re-trip or how I tripped them in order to get other endings that may or may not exist. Because one of the problems is one of the first endings I got, I think the second ending I got, was, um, I'm going to call it the museum ending. I don't know the official endings for these names. but I, I don't got, know what they're called either. Yeah, uh, but if there's some listener out there. But I got the museum ending, where you wind up in a museum that explains the game. And part of that is they're explaining 
some of the variables, and they talk specifically yes. about some of the confusing ones that they removed because it was confusing people. And so when I started seeing the variables that they left in, I was going, okay, what did I do to trip this? I'm not entirely sure. And now that I've tripped it, is it going to change something else down the line? And so at some point, I just want to see what the endings are, but I don't want to have to figure out what all the different things are. Because, I mean, to give, again, I've said I was going to give spoilers. You start off in Stanley's cubicle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Sometimes you start just outside of Stanley's cubicle. Sometimes you start just outside the room with the two doors. Sometimes you start halfway in between Stanley's cubicle and the rooms with the two doors. Sometimes there's clear floors. Sometimes there's papers all over the floor. Sometimes um, your coworker's computer is asking for an input. Sometimes your coworker's computer is blank. There's oh, I never noticed that. I did. <laughs> there and so I kept seeing all of these different changes happening, and I don't like I did the nuclear ending I think four times, trying different ways to get there to see if there was a different way to get through it. I still don't know if there's a way to get through the nuclear ending other than just dying, which I did four times. And so I'm not the kind of person who takes pleasure in trying to figure out which exactly variables I need to trick to get over there to figure out if you can survive the nuclear ending, if you can survive the nuclear ending. That's because there's not enough, for me, gameplay to make that enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Now, on the flip side, I played, I've played, I probably will again at some point, the original Fallout from start to finish multiple times with different characters. At its most basic level, the original Fallout is the same thing. That's a good point, yeah. You go to different places, you make different choices, those choices somehow impact the rest of the game and how things happen. And the reason why I specifically brought up the nuclear ending that I did four times is because Fallout also has a nuclear ending. And there's many different ways to get to it, to interact with it, to deal with it. Do you shoot your way through? Do you talk your way through? Do you sneak your way through? Um, All these different things that you can do with it, but the gameplay is more compelling in Fallout for me that makes me want to continue playing it. Whereas with the Stanley Parable, once I got through it a few different times and saw what I'm pretty sure I saw, at least even if I didn't figure out all the ways out, I found all the different rooms. That and it was enough for me that I'm pretty much done with it. And so for in, in something like Bandersnatch, I, I find a very similar thing where I think I ended up seeing all the endings for that. But I think in the end, because I was with a friend watching that one, um, and I think for one of the final endings, we just looked up the flow chart to get to it. Because we were like, okay, hold on. How did we get back to this one part where we had to choose the A or B, and we chose B, but this time we want to choose A, but we can't actually get back to that same question mm-hmm. again. And so at some point, you're watching the same thing over and over and over because there's not a bunch of different ways to influence the story, mm-hmm. and you're bored of it. Whereas with the original book form, you can just go back to where your finger's in the book and restart there, and you've already got the memory of how you got there. So you don't need to reread all the bits to it. So it's interesting, and I enjoyed the humor, but its gameplay was not compelling enough to make me, A, want to go find the rest of the endings, or B, probably want to play it again. I think you're overthinking the game. I guess they describe it, from the looks of it, as more like a drama. I guess similar to Bandersnatch, where you're more experiencing a story rather than, like in Fallout, where you have a lot more interaction and you have a lot more agency on the world. And I don't think there's a way to to disengage the bomb, actually looking at this flowchart of endings and stuff, there actually isn't a way to disengage the bomb. Okay, well then I'm really glad I didn't spend more time trying to do that. Yeah. Especially because I thought that one of the times when I was in the bomb room, I thought I saw one of the doors that was locked, I, had a green light over it. I think that was the n- narrator trolling you. Well, that's annoying to me because it gives a false hope that you can get out. Yeah. And if I had sat there and like tried it multiple times to reset up whatever I could have done without thinking, hey, maybe... I just because my thought wouldn't be that there isn't a way out. My thought would would be I haven't tripped the right variable to get there. Mm, yeah, I guess the whole um, the I guess we interpreted the game in very different ways because I got the impression that the narrator is trying is actually trying to help you, but because you never listen to it, it gets very frustrated and then kind of turns into a dick, and that's where the comedy comes from. I and then so it's more of a I'm gonna be snarky and you've got to experience the different stories with the narrator more than actually like quote unquote solving the game no it's not even that i wanted to solve the game i just wanted to see what the different endings were Mm. then 
Because then it kind of comes down to the whole fear of missing out phenomenon, mm. where yes. if there's more comedy to be had in the different endings, what's going on there? Because, for instance, the one that you told me about, the one thing you remembered from the game was go hide in a broom closet until the narrator like has his own manic breakdown. Um, and I enjoyed that. I never would have found that. Yeah. Wouldn't right. have happened. Because you would have gone in being like, okay, I'm going to leave. Well, also because because of the lack of interactions in the early rooms, I had somewhat given up on that type of exploration. Mm. So I would have gone into the broom closet. There would have been nothing to... Essentially, there would have been no variable to flip. And so I would have been like, okay, what the heck? And I would have left, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, that's actually a problem that I recently had in a role-playing game, where due to an interaction in an early room, it changed how the players looked at the rest of the dungeon. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember that. Because... So it's... If I were to give a critique then for the makers of the games, if they want you to try interacting with things more, mm. there needs to be something early to interact with. Otherwise, players are going to give up on that. Yeah. You need to introduce the language of the game. I guess also you didn't really realize what kind of game it was until you, I was like, don't leave the broom closet. And you're like, okay. And then you stayed there and then the no, narrator became more and more. Yeah, I'd figured it out before then, though. Oh, okay. Um, as soon as I got to the room with the two doors and the fact that the narrator is British... I kind what? of had, what? What? I kind what? of had an idea for where what kind of how the story was going and where it was going. Yeah. You know, as soon as I got to that, as soon as you walk into a room with two doors and a narrator says, Take the left door, you're going, Okay, I'm gonna choose your own adventure game, but you're also going the narrator is I mean, a narrator is always another character, but in this case it's playing a bigger role than that. And so the first time, you know, I've kind of followed the narrator from the beginning, doing this and that and this and that. And then, actually, no, the first time is the one where I was like, okay, I'll fo- agree with the narrator for the first one. And then you get to the, the meeting stairs. room and all that. Yeah. And then you get to the stairs. And as soon as I got the stairs, I'm like, mm, I'm going to ignore the narrator this time. And so I went down the stairs instead of up the stairs and went insane and wound up, like, having an aneurysm on the street. And some woman found my body. And that was my first ending. And so then I was like, okay, well, what, what if we do this or what if we do that? And so then it's kind of the feeling things out stage of the game. So I think... I had a grasp on what type of humor it was going to be, especially after my character went insane and had an aneurysm, Um, which is good. I I enjoy that style of humor. Yeah, that's why I thought you'd enjoy it. And I did. I did. I just (laughs) had no interest in replaying it. You, I mean, you played it for like two hours straight. Yes. And even I was kind of bored of you of watching you play it after two hours. I I think probably if you were to play it an hour exploring different endings and then maybe do it an hour another time and like pace yourself rather than because rather than getting game fatigue or maybe that's just me i think if i'd played an hour and stopped then i still wouldn't have re-picked it up Mm. i just would have seen less of it yeah that's fair enough for me personally it's a very one and done game and that's how some games are um i i keep you know drawing illusions between this and other games and in that category i'd put a game like Cards Against Humanity in a very similar category. Once you've seen the cards in Cards Against Humanity, unless you go out and buy another expansion deck, it's kind of done. That's true. After playing it for a long time, you get bored of it because yeah. there's nothing else there. Actually, you've I'm looking seen at, the jokes and you already know what's coming. I'm looking at this flowchart and I think you pretty much got almost all of them. Well, there you go then. <laughs> yeah. I think you missed two that even I didn't know about. Which is one where you close your office door and one where you can go out through an escape pod in the boss's room. Nice. Well, I didn't close my office door because I, admittedly, it wasn't a cubicle, but I did the wage slave life for 10 years. <laughs> um, so I didn't need to do that in a video game for another two hours. And I thought the, all the doors keep locking behind you, so I, I don't know how you escape out the boss's room, but life goes on. I don't think the boss, I don't know. I haven't seen it. But that was the boss's room to bring to mind. That's another room where I was talking about which variables do you need to have flip to do it? Because sometimes you go into the room and the voice has to tell you what the passcode is. Sometimes the voice just is exasperated and says you already know what the passcode is. Sometimes the voice is like, why would I wait for you to even put in the passcode? And it just opens it automatically. I think it's because it knows that players are going to be playing through this over and over and over again. And so the program going a bit meta here, the program itself is like, okay, you've already played this and you already know this because you've shown it in a previous playthrough. So this will trigger this narration and this progression. 
in order to kind of keep it fresh without having to do the same thing over and over again. And to add a little bit of comedy as the narrator goes, oh my god, you've already done this, just go, just go. Yes. So I think in that way they were trying to keep it slightly varied, trying to give a little bit of spice in another ways. Yeah, well, I've ever thought it, and I thought that was, I was flipping different variables again. Ah. <laughs> Uh, maybe it was because I was thinking of it from like a game developer point of view, where I was like, well, that would actually make sense to then try and create a little bit of variety so you're not doing the same thing over and over again. I suppose. Because, I mean, if you die like a bajillion times, you don't want to play through the same scene over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. That's true. So I think so- that's why sometimes they just skip your co-workers' offices and you're suddenly in the room with two doors. But then at other times, don't put me outside of my cubicle with a bunch of papers on the ground. <laughs> I thought that was cool. I thought it was like, oh, something's different. Yeah, I know. And funny enough, I've been playing Control, which is very much a, you're stuck in an office building that is deserted, that has a lot of really weird stuff going on. And I could, like, Stanley Parable really reminded me of some parts of that. Yeah, but from what I saw of you playing Control, there's a lot more gameplay in that. Yes, there is a lot more gameplay. Like, a lot of gameplay. And yes. a lot of story. It's not a comedy. No. But it's good. <laughs> but, I mean, in terms of, like, office environment, deserted, creepy, it kind of kept... It, it had very similar vibes to it. Mm. Even though it was completely different it, engine made almost a decade apart from each other. Yes. So I'm thinking about it more. Oh. <laughs> well, and then you've... At least it's got you thinking. Well, you've got me thinking about adventure games. And adventure books and adventure TV shows and whatever they're going to do with the genre next. Okay. And I think also part of what it comes down to for me is how, like, when you have a branch, do you immediately cut off the branch and put an ending there if they've gone the wrong way? Or do you let that go really far and then branch back? Or how does that work? Because I, like, I was saying that a lot of computer games boil down to adventure games. In the sense that, I mean, you know, there's a whole genre called adventure games, but in the sense that it's always giving you A or B options, and if you choose A or B, it should influence the story somewhat. Now... It it varies greatly depending on... The game. The game. I mean, like, and famously, in something like Mass Effect, it gives you A and B throughout the whole game, but it actually doesn't matter because at the end you just have, like, two endings. But it matters between games, and that was the cool thing about... Uh, Mass Effect is that you could play a trilogy of games and your decisions from the first game could impact how the last game played, apart from obviously the grand ending. But that's besides the point. But I mean, yeah, that, and that's that would, but that would be that's because they don't want to make a bunch of endings. Yes. And I guess the thing with the with Mass Effect in particular is, like you said, they don't want to make a bunch of endings. And so, even no matter what decisions you make, you still have to hit those core narrative beats throughout the whole series. Yes. So it's always branching out and coming back in and branching out and coming back in. Have you played any of the David Cage bo- uh, b- books, games? Have you played any of the David Cage games? Quantum Dream. Quantic? Quantic Dream. Like Heavy Rain. I know you haven't Alan played... Alan Wake? Was that one of his? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I don't... No, I don't think I've played any of his games. Okay, because those are... I mean, even though David Cage is not a human I particularly like... His games are basically choose your own adventure books, but in the form of games. And that your deci- the decisions you make really do change the ending strip drastically. And you have multiple characters, and if one dies right at the beginning, they're dead for the rest of the story. That's fine. Um, is there the actual game gameplay, end. or are we talking like visual novel? Uh, it's kind of like a visual novel with quick time events. That annoys me. Because then we're <laughs> going to be back in the same issue, especially. But how can you have the interactive level unless you do something more like Fallout? I love Fallout. I know, but, but and I, I guess mean, it's I just guess, a different style of game. Yeah, and I guess what I'm getting to in the end is that computer games aren't at a level where you can really offer a satisfying adventure game to me. And I'm going to say mm. to me because either you have gr- either you have a, a developer who's willing to put in a bunch of material that you know no one's ever going to see, which some do. And friends, I mean, like let's say I was playing Heavy Rain. And I played through the story the whole way through. And I got to an ending. My own stubbornness would probably let me see it through to an ending. But if I didn't like how the game played, I wouldn't go back and replay it. So if you have a bunch of wildly disparate endings, there's going to be a lot of them that I, and probably a lot of people like me, would never actually see. And so a developer has to be okay with the fact that a lot of their work, people are never going to see. 
And I get the feeling that a lot of developers and a lot of creators, including me, a lot of creative types, aren't willing to do that because if they're going to put so much work into it, they want people to see it. Bingo. And that's why I think computer games have a problem with the choose your own adventure thing is because going back and playing all the different routes, unless you've made a really fun and engaging game, people are going to be anno- either people are going to be annoyed that you've given a bunch of options that don't actually amount to anything, or you're going to have to make a bunch of endings that people don't see. And so, for instance, Mass Effect 3 got a lot of backlash at the end because people were really annoyed that the whole time they're saying, make your own shepherd, make your own shepherd, make your own shepherd, only for it to not really matter in the end. So you're sitting there going, yes, I'm making my own character. It's different from everyone else's. This is my own individual shepherd. And then in the end, they're like, yeah, but it doesn't matter because it's still a video game and we want you to see all this cool shit we put into the ending. I think that's why um, the Quantic Dream games are good as a choose your own adventure because I didn't... Okay, so there was um, The Nomad Soul, Fahrenheit, Heavy Rain, Beyond Two Souls, and Detroit Become Human. I've played Heavy Rain, Beyond Two Souls, and I've watched Detroit Become Human. Detroit Become Human, which came out in 2018, once you've played it through, lets you jump back to a point in the story and carry on from that point from it and make different choices if you want to. So it does allow you to do the, I'm going to put my finger in this page and go back. Well, that's better then. Without having to play through the whole thing. Beyond Two Souls, I think I played through twice, but I think Beyond Two Souls had the problem where you were only following one character and so it didn't really have as much branching narrative or as branching stories similar to Heavy Rain or Detroit Become Human because it was following one character and it was kind of following points in her life. That was the one with um, Ellen Page. Yeah. Yeah, I remember watching you play it. Where you're like locked in the room with a creepy doctor. That's why I don't like... Cage, because he always decides, oh, I need to put drama in this by having women be assaulted. And it's like, why are you so creepy? This doesn't need to be in here. Anyway, but that's besides the point. But if you wanted to have like a more modern choose your own adventure video game, then as long as you ignore the poor writing, Detroit Become Human is good. If there's no gameplay but quick time events, then I don't want poor writing because that's the only thing that's left. Yeah. So if I don't have good gameplay and I don't enjoy quick play events and it doesn't have good writing, you're not selling me on this game yet. Oh, no, I'm not recommending this to you. Good. I'm recommending this to people in general. I think you would hate Quantic Dreams games. Okay, so... But let I, think me, you'd let me, li- I think you'd enjoy Sunny Parable, which is why I recommended it to you. Then. Okay. <laughs> Jen's recommendation for a game. If you're a type of gamer who doesn't like good gameplay <laughs> and doesn't like good story, and then themselves. I've got a game for you. Yeah, exactly. Wow, they really are British. What? I'm just saying, I've seen the way your country tries to sell stuff, and that's right in line with it. <laughs> You're not wrong, but I feel like I should be offended. Well, too bad. <laughs> but, <laughs> Typical no, American offending everybody around them. Well, we like to sell stuff, and we do it with a smile in America. Um, and a backhanded compliment. Usually. Um, <laughs> but no, I think, though, what I was getting at in the thing is that the developers put so much money into video games that they want people to see everything they've made. Yes. But at the same time, if you wanted to make a bunch of different endings, that would still take a lot of money and just probably not be as flashy. And so when it comes to the kid in me who read adventure books and is now an adult, I think that's still where like actual role-playing games with other people has the leg up. It's because so long as you have a good GM or DM for people playing D&D... And a good crew. And a good crew. But I think in speci- specifically for this point, it's going to you're putting a lot of weight on the DM to be able to react to what the players mm-hmm. do. Everyone's going to have stories about being railroaded. And most of games do that by their very nature because they can't be open-ended. Yes, they're but, limited strictly. Yeah. And I don't know how you fix that. Development. I mean, we can see games evolving now. They've evolved drastically since Stanley Parable. That's true. And I think, honestly, just every single time a video game developer creates a new game, they're always improving upon, or at least in theory, they should be improving upon the game that they've released previously. No, they're slapping a fresh coat of paint on it and slamming it out the door to get more money. It depends on the developer. It That's really why I doesn't. It, should. it really doesn't. Um. <laughs> wow, cynicism here. I mean, I agree with you, but wow, cynicism <laughs> <laughs> Do you think choose your own adventure games are dead, or do you think that with enough trial and error we could perfect it? Probably not to the same level of a GM in a tabletop roleplay game, but in terms of video games. If developers are willing to pull their ego out of it, yeah, I think we can do more. Oh god, developers are never gonna pull their ego out of then it. Then we're doomed. <laughs> because it's 
I mean, I don't think that the modern Fallouts do as good of a job as Fallout 1 and 2 in this regard. But even still, when I was watching you play Fallout 4, there were a lot of things that I'm assuming you missed or didn't do. Oh yeah, probably. Just because of the nature of the game. Um, I mean, I guess on some level, you always have to wind up in what's it called a facility or something like that. But how you get, there's a million different ways to get there. Um, and yeah, even in the original ones, you had to find uh, the water chip, you had to find the geck. That was what Fallout 1 and Fallout 2, that was your basic reason to get you out of the vault or out of the village. But there was, Fallout 2 was more open-ended. So long as developers are continuing to make interactive movies, we're not going to get a good adventure game. And I feel like more and more games are turning into interactive movies. And so long as that's what the developer wants to do, yes. I think that's fine. But don't try to make me the character at that point. Yeah. Like, if I'm playing The Witcher 3, I'm not making my character. I'm playing Geralt. And you're telling me Geralt's story and letting me interact in it. And so... You know, if I don't get to make a bunch of choices as to how Geralt evolves, you know, maybe you get to put in your skill points or whatever so you can fight in your own way. But you're not making your own Geralt, if that makes sense. Yeah. Whereas on the flip side, I think the problem that Mass Effect had was they really sold that you're making your own Shepard. And so at the end, when it turned out that your own Shepard didn't actually matter, I think that's what upset people. But also the fact that everything they'd done up to that point didn't matter. Either. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying is... Not they're told just you're making your own individual character, but then at the end of the game, like none of your, your choices shepherd didn't matter from anyone else's shepherd. Yeah, it could have been you could have just had this be rugged shepherd 101 or rugged fem shep 101, and it wouldn't have mattered. Everything else was just window dressing at that point. And I think that that's where you're gonna have the struggle is that if you try to make the players feel they have too much agency, they're gonna fight back when it's revealed that they don't. So I guess that's where developers have to find the balance between giving their players, well, I guess depending on the type of video game, but giving their players agency while also giving them entertainment. Yes. Because, I, I mean, oh God, video games are just so different from each other that it's kind of hard to, I think now, to put them into clear boxes because they overlap with each other so much. Oh, but that's a whole other discussion. Yes. That we'll no doubt get back to. Because at the moment, I'm playing another game that we'll be talking about and I will want to bring up some of this in that. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, you're actually going to play it through to the end? I think so. After all these years? I think so. Even at a time like this? It's definitely at a time like this. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that. But that brings an end to our Stanley Parable episode. Yay! Even though we spent most of it talking about other games, but that's fine. That is fine. Yeah, but we talked about it through the lens of the Stanley Parable. That's true. Which was a man in his cubicle pushing buttons on a computer and going insane. Ah, just like my life. <laughs> exactly. Well, you can find us at anybroscreative.com or on Twitter at anybroscreative. You can also find some of our sibling podcasts there, like Real Japan and Annie Bros Prime. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll catch you in the next one. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.